Have you ever noticed there's a direct correlation between a group of people and those whom they follow as their leader? You, you can search near, nearly anywhere, in, in almost any setting at any time, and you will find that there is a connection, a correlation between a group and how they live and act and the, the leader that they follow. Let me give you some examples. You see this very clearly in the political realm and politics. Certain politicians have the ability, whether it's for positive or negative, to influence their constituents by their character, even their personality. And uh, their constituents tend to mimic those character qualities and act the same way as they do or do the same things. Maybe they even have some of the same vices or virtues. You see this in cults. Uh, cult religions or cult practices, whether it be something like Mormonism or some of the more bizarre cults, their followers tend to act like their leaders. And uh, many of the followers act in, in similar ways. Sometimes you, you can kind of spot them. The same is true of sports teams. If you're a sports fan, whether it's baseball or football or whatever it is, uh, there are certain teams, and I won't mention those teams that are in my head, but certain teams, uh, their, their team members or their constituents or followers always are the ones who tend to be rude or arrogant or in, their, in your face about their sports team as, as part of the, the club sports mentality, I suppose, being a fan of a particular sports team. In most cases, most scenarios, people act like who they choose to follow. Their leader or group or organization has an incredible impact on them. And the same is true in the church. Church leaders and ministry leaders can have an incredible impact on those who follow them and minister alongside of them. And it can be in the case of a church that church members pick up certain qualities or certain character traits of those whom they follow, their pastor or other people in the church, and maybe whether knowingly or not, they model them. It's always interesting for me, when I look at my sermons, you, you can tell who I've listened to or who I've read the week before in preparation for the sermon, because I'll, I'll hear certain ways of uh, conveying information that'll come out. Or uh, sometimes if I listen to a speaker in person, and I, I watch them certain, doing certain gestures or mannerisms, I tend to unknowingly mimic them the next time I'm doing public speaking. I've even met people in, uh, in Minnesota around the cities, and I could usually tell these certain people that they came from a certain well-known church in downtown Minneapolis with a certain well-known pastor because of his well-known expressions and, and way of conveying um, material. Pastors and teachers in the church can have a large impact on the people who are part of the church themselves. And we like to think that that is a good impact. Fortunately, that's not always the case. Pastors, as you know, are human too, and sometimes even our negative traits can influence church members in a negative way. And as we come to our text Today, from Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 5, this seems to be the case that was happening with the churches 
that were on the island of Crete. They had pastors who were, in their case, living ungodly lives. And their lifestyle had a negative impact on the church members and those in the church. And it, in turn, affected the church members in a negative way. They were beginning to maybe catch on to some of the bad character traits of their church leaders. And so, as we've been talking about the past few weeks, Paul sends Titus to Crete to, as he describes it, set things right in the church and raise up new elders, new leaders. And so, as he does that, Paul reminds Titus what churches should look for in their leadership what churches should look for in a pastor, and why the character of a pastor is so vitally important. And so Paul teaches Titus, in the text that we're going to look at today, leadership influences membership. <laughs> leadership influences membership, so churches need to be careful to choose the right leaders. And Paul talks about that in our text this morning. So let's go ahead and read Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Titus 1, 5 through 9. I'll be reading my translation this morning. Paul says, For this reason I left you in Crete, in order that you might set right the things lacking, and that you might appoint elders in every city, if anyone is above reproach, a one-woman man having faithful children, not accused of recklessness or rebellion. For it is necessary that the overseer, uh, for the overseer to be blameless as a steward of God, not arrogant, not quick tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not fond of dishonest gain, but rather hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, devout, self controlled, holding fast to the faithful word according to teaching, in order that they are able to exhort and sound teaching, and expose those who contradict. Leadership influences membership. So it stands to reason that churches need to be very careful to ensure that they choose the right leaders. And if we walk through the text this morning that we just read, we find four specific areas that Paul mentions Four specific areas in which leadership in the church should model godliness for its members. First one we find right in the beginning of the text, Paul addresses the moral commitment of a leader. Now, boys and girls, if you're following along in the children's worksheet, you can draw someone with a clean heart. I just kind of drew a heart there and wrote the words clean inside. Because Paul addresses this here. This idea of moral commitment, these four specific areas in which pastors, church leaders, ministry leaders are to model character. Uh, But notice how he opens up in the text, For this reason I left you in Crete, in order that you may set right the things lacking, and you might appoint elders in every city. We dealt with that last week, just that one verse. So we won't get too much into it this week, but by way of review, last week you can find the sermon online. We noted that Paul sent Titus to Crete to appoint elders. And we noted last time that he wasn't doing the calling of elders. God calls men into ministry. He was doing the appointing of elders and helping churches to set up new leadership. And he was involved in that. And notice who is in vision here, the the term, the office of elder. We looked at that last week and we saw three pictures in the New Testament of ministerial leadership in the church. We looked at elder, a picture of spiritual maturity, pastor, a picture of nurturing care, and overseer, a picture of wise leadership. Three different pictures describing one office. The term elder is mentioned in the beginning of our text today, speaking of a wise leader uh, who's called to lead a church. It's what we looked at last week. But we come back to the rest of our text, and Paul focuses on the moral commitment of a leader. He says, if anyone is above reproach. Now that is kind of an overarching category here. The first criteria he gives is actually an overarching summary. All the things he goes on and talks later fits under that above reproach. So we should talk about what does that mean? Vocational ministry requires someone above 
reproach. Well, well, why is that important? Well, you see that in our text. And in the next couple verses, because apparently in Crete, men had flocked to pastoral ministry out of selfish ambition, perhaps a desire to have an unbiblical model of leadership, maybe be in charge, be the person who dictates what, what happens, whatever, and it corrupted them. Because leadership often corrupts. The result was these men in Crete needed to be removed and replaced with men who meet the criteria Paul mentions, and he starts out with above reproach. What does that mean? Well, it certainly doesn't mean he's perfect. We know that. And it's important to note here that pastors are human too. Pastors have sinful tendencies. Pastors sin. They have a sin nature just like anybody else. I remember when I was in seminary, one of my pastors told the story of doing a Bible study with a man who was not yet a believer. And this man was, uh, was from India. He was uh, in the States, but he grew up in India. He spoke with an accent. He, he knew, uh, knew the Hindu dialect there. And in their Bible study, my pastor, who at this point was you know, probably around 70, you know, an older, mature man, was talking about sin. And my pastor told this man that my, my pastor sinned too. And according to my pastor, he got this really surprised look on his face and said, you, you sin too? He, he had never heard that before. And I guess suppose, I, I suppose in their... <clears throat> In their Hindu background with uh, gurus and religious teachers, they probably thought that their uh, religious teachers had reached some point of enlightenment where they didn't make uh, mistakes or didn't sin, I suppose. But the reality of it is pastors are not perfect. We make mistakes. We have to apologize sometimes. And when we assume or we expect that pastors are somehow perfect, it actually causes problems in the church. In fact, that's probably what happened with the church in Crete. They had this assumption, maybe, that pastors are always right, that they don't sin, that because of their leadership model, whatever they say is always right, and they allowed sinful men to behave sinfully in ministry. And unfortunately, this happens sometimes in churches today, even beyond pastors. Church leaders, people who've been at church for a long time, you know, think of your, your stakeholder of the church, can, can be, uh, almost achieve this status of sainthood, where we blindly accept what, you know, what Brother Bill uh, always says. We believe everything that so-and-so says, and uh, we, we don't, we don't ima can't imagine that, oh, they would never do that. They would never sin. I mean, I know they're not, you know, everyone's sinners, but they would never and we kind of make this category of excuse for either church leaders or people who have some sort of leadership in the church. And that causes a whole lot of problems in churches today when we blindly accept people, assume they don't sin, and maybe we make excuses for sin that might come to light. We need to hold our leaders accountable. And scripture talks about that, and there are certain ways to do that. So it doesn't mean they're perfect. What does it mean? What does it mean to say you need to be above reproach? Well, this is the idea of being free from any sort of public scandal. Someone uh, who is not worthy of a charge of wrongdoing. Not that they're perfect, but there is no significant accusation that can stick to them. And I say significant because I think that's important to, uh, to mention. You know, he snubbed me on the way out of church when he didn't shake my hand. <laughs> it's not a significant accusation against somebody. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But uh, what we're talking about is an accusation that would uh, corrupt or create discolor, disfavor on the name of Christ. And so Paul expresses this here. And it's the idea of not having anything significant that you can hang on a person. I like to think of it like a coat rack or a hat rack. You take your coat and you, you hang it on the coat rack. And if your, your hook on the coat rack isn't big enough, your coat might fall down. And the idea here is not having anything that you can hang on this individual. I should note, it doesn't mean that people don't make accusations. Or people don't have stories. 
when you're in a role like a pastor or leader in the church, oftentimes you do make enemies. Your position is a natural place for people to put a target on your back. And Satan loves to destroy leaders in ministry. And so being above reproach doesn't mean that nobody can accuse you of anything. It means that nothing significant can stick. And let me tell you, there's always people trying to make those sort of things. People who are trying to discredit a leader, trying to say, well, they did this or they did that. There's always those sort of people. And unfortunately, those people tend to have oftentimes the loudest voices. This is why so many pastors quit ministry. This is why we have a pastoral shortage in the United States of America, because sometimes churches are incredibly hard on their leaders. <clears throat> And sometimes men, particularly young men who are new and green, don't make it too long in ministry, not because they've experienced some moral failure, but because of the, uh, the uh, conflict, the accusations, the people who are against them. And oftentimes it may only be a small minority, but they have the loudest voice. So what does that mean for you? Well, that means you need to support your pastor. And that means you need to have a louder voice, right? But there are so many men I can think of in my, uh, in my tenure in ministry, I'm, I'm in my 10th year of some sort of vocational ministry, and I know of men, uh, lots of men who have quit, not because of some moral failure or disqualification, but because of the burden is too much. And they make it one, two, three, four years and say, I, I just can't handle it. Either that or I know of other men who just kind of jump around every one or two or three years. They're cycling into another church, never staying long enough to have a significant ministry. Why? Because sometimes people are against you. And so when Paul talks about being above reproach, he's not saying no one's going to say anything negative about you. He's saying they don't have any accusation that can stick. So, continuing in our text, Paul says, above reproach, the implication here is nothing can stick. Not that he's perfect, not that a pastor is perfect. A man could never be perfect except the man Christ Jesus. And we celebrate him this time of year with, with Easter. Not that he's perfect, but there's no significant scandal or public issue that can be hung on him to discredit his ministry and uh, give cause for the devil to have a victory. And so we get back to this idea of moral commitment. Paul says a pastor, a man in ministry, must be above reproach, a one-woman man. Some translations say husband of one wife. The literal rendering is that of a one-woman man. That's why I translated it that way in the text that I read for you. But what does this refer to? There's a lot of differences of opinion. There's a lot of discussion what this means. Some suggest... Well, this refers to polygamy and that a, a pastor should only have, uh, have one wife. Well, that is important. I don't think necessarily that's what's referred to in the text, though it might have some implications for that. Others suggest this refers to divorce and that a man in ministry uh, cannot be someone who has been divorced and remarried. And while I think this text could have implications for a scenario like that, I'm not sure that's the main thrust of the text either. Still others think it means, well, a pastor can be a single person. He has to have a wife. He has to be married. I'm not sure that this passage necessarily means that, though I, I don't know of many uh, single pastors, and I think it's of great benefit to pastors to be married. I don't think it's saying that a single man can never be a pastor. So what's going on here in this text? Keep in mind we're talking about a man's character and qualifications. And so Paul is talking about more about his character, the character by which he is known then maybe more than the certain things he does or, or doesn't do. And so I believe what Paul is talking about here is that pastors be a one-woman kind of man, a man who is known as devoted to his spouse if he has one. He doesn't cheat on his marital vows. He's not loose or careless with women. 
He maintains appropriate boundaries, and he, he is known, he has this character quality as someone who is being a one-woman type of man, faithful, loving devotion to his wife. This really is abnormal for our world today, isn't it? It's abnormal for a world today. We live in a culture that doesn't teach men to be faithful and loyal to their spouses. Let me rephrase that. It doesn't teach men to be faithful and loyal to their wives. Spouse could mean something else, and that's not what we're trying to say this morning. We live in a culture that says do what you want, enjoy what you want, have what you want, You are the king of the throne of your life, so nothing should stand in the way of your happiness. And God calls men, especially pastors, to be countercultural in this way. Let me point out that while this text is written to pastors, much of it applies to all men. Guys, men, God wants you to be a one woman type of man. He wants you to lead a life that shows faithful devotion to your spouse. Young men, those of you who are here who aren't married yet, God wants you to strive to be this type of man in preparation for whatever relationship God brings along the way. Young ladies out there who maybe aren't married yet, God wants you to look for this type of man. A one woman type of man, it doesn't matter how handsome or good looking or sweet and kind he is, if he's not going to be faithful to your relationship, it will ruin it. And there are many implications here from our text. God wants all men, especially pastors, to be an example in this way. And so Paul reminds us that leadership influences membership. Leadership influences membership. So churches... Should, should look for the right type of leaders. We continue on in our text. We find a second criteria or second quality or area in which church leaders should model godliness for a church, and this is in family leadership. Pastors, men in ministry are to lead their families. Boys and girls, you can draw a picture of a family. You can see the family that I just kind of sketched up there. Look at what it says in our text. Having faithful children, not accused of recklessness or rebellion. This brings up an issue, doesn't it? Because your translation might say something a little different. Your translation might say having children who believe. There are some translations that say that. And what we encounter is that there's a translation issue here in our text. The Greek word here. A word that maybe you've heard before is the Greek word pistos, which means faithful, reliable, or believing. So which is it? Having believing children or having faithful children? Well, let me first of all remind you that salvation ultimately is a work of God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit inside the individual of someone's life, inside their life, and we cannot make someone saved. Sometimes you might wish that. You might wish you could make someone saved, but we cannot. Can't save another person. Only God can save another person. So if Paul and God is requiring a pastor's children to be believers, then it would seem, at least to me, that he is placing responsibility for salvation on the man when that's a work that God does. Furthermore, this brings up, if you're going to hold that view, some other questions. If God calls a man into ministry, but his children aren't yet believers, what does that mean? Does that mean he has to wait? Does it mean he's not really called? Would God call him something to do something that he couldn't really fulfill? There, there, there's some issues here. And so this viewpoint that pastor's children need to be saved, though it is faithful to the text, it's a legitimate, accurate translation, it brings all kinds of questions, I, I think. And so I believe we should look for a better alternative, which is what I already read to you that they need to be faithful in keeping with the rest of the text where it says they are to be not accused of recklessness or rebellion. Well, what does that mean? Recklessness, the term used here, refers to someone who lives in an excessively flagrant lifestyle. person who they know what's right and they say, I'm going to do the opposite. A rebellious person is someone who decides or determines to live life on their own. 
And so Paul here is talking about the character of the children in a pastor's home being the opposite of this. Not necessarily that they are believers, but that their lifestyle is not contradicting the message that their father preaches. So I think, this is again my view and there's debates on this, I think Paul is referring not necessarily to children who are believers because parents don't have control over that. You wish you did, right? You wish that you could control whether your kids trusted Christ or not. We don't have control over that. So I think Paul instead has in mind children who are faithful in the sense that they're faithful and obedient to their parents. They practice listening and obedience. Now, now why is this important? I mean, who really cares about a pastor's kids? Well, for one, God cares because it's in the text. And you should too because what's really in view here is not as much the lifestyles of a pastor's kids as much as it is the parenting in the home. How does a pastor and his wife, how do they parent their children? And if we are to interpret the text the way that I am suggesting here, as talking about faithful children whose lifestyles do not contradict what their dad preaches in the pulpit, then this goes hand in hand with what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5, when he talks about pastors and says they must be one who manage the household well, keeping children under control with all dignity. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God. Again, what Paul mentions in Titus, I believe, fits hand in hand with what he says in 1 Timothy. Faithful, obedient children who are not openly rebellious, who are not living a lifestyle of degradation while still under his roof. I don't think this applies to adult children who are 45. They can make their own decisions. Doesn't mean that a pastor is perfect in leading his home or his wife is perfect in parenting the kids, or the kids are perfect, but it means that, they, that the pastor is working and growing and taking leadership in home, being a good dad, a good husband, therefore setting an example in that regard. Now let me illustrate this, because I think we see a good illustration in the Bible of a leader of ministry, not a pastor, but a leader of ministry who, who failed and who fits this description of uh, not having faithful children. Remember Eli? Eli in the Old Testament, Eli was the high priest. Uh, for 40 years, he was the high priest. And he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were also priests. And if you know the story, Hophni and Phinehas were wicked, wicked men. They stole sacrifices. They committed immorality with women who would come to the temple to offer sacrifices. And these were horrible guys. And their lifestyle undermined Levi or excuse me, Eli, and his message as a priest and everything that his office stood for. Now these, these were adults, and so maybe it's not quite the same uh, scenario, but they were still priests and they were still his children, and their way of living undermined everything Eli did as a priest. I think this is the type of scenario that we're talking about. Pastors need to be able to lead their family well, and their response um, uh, their response to that is reflective of how well they do. Now, let me point out a few things here. I think we need to be careful that we don't set the bar too high, especially for pastor's kids. Because it can be really easy to assume that pastor's kids need to be perfect, right? Pastor's kids live in a fishbowl. And everybody expects pastor's kids to be perfect. They're not. And living in a pastor's home is difficult for kids. They don't get to come to church in the same way that normal families come to church because they're the pastor's family. And Sundays are often very hard for pastor's kids, even for pastor's wives, because it's a full day of ministry for dad. Most Sundays I'm here between 6 and 6.30, buttoning up my sermon, printing out notes, getting things ready, I usually go home by 7.30 to shower and get changed for church. If I'm on worship team, I'm back by 8.15, and I meet the family back again here at church for Sunday school at 9. Sundays are very taxing on a pastor's family, particularly a family with young children. And after church, they're tired, and honestly, so am I. And sometimes I think we need to give pastor's kids a measure of grace that we understand they're not perfect. That Sundays are hard. 
Sometimes mom is doing things all by herself because dad's doing ministry. And so we, we need to have a little measure of grace there, but we can't avoid what Paul says. What Paul says is important. Pastors need to lead their family well. And the, the degree that they lead their family ought to be reflected in the ability of kids to listen and obey and not undermine, undermine ministry by how they live their lives. Why? Well, leaders influence membership. Pastors influence people. So churches need to have the right criteria, set the right standards for their leaders. Keep going in our text. We find the third area that Paul mentions. He mentions external character. External character. God expects pastors to be able to model externally what Christ is doing for them internally. Boys and girls, you can draw an upright person who does right. I was asking the boys who I should draw this morning, and they said I should draw David while he was praying. So that's David praying. You can tell that, I'm sure. But there, there's a standard here that Paul gives in our text that pastors are to be able to model. Apparently, this wasn't happening in Crete, which is why Paul brings it up. And notice how he addresses it in verse 7. You can see what he says in your copy of the scriptures. He says, it is necessary for the overseer to be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not, a fond, not fond of dishonest gain. Now notice, first of all, in verse 7, the word overseer. This is not the same word as verse 5, elder. This is a different Greek word, and Paul's using them synonymously. We talked about this last week. Overseer refers to wise leadership. Elder refers to a spiritually mature person. And here we find both of them in our text talking about this one office of pastor slash overseer slash elder. And notice, again, he, uh, he re, re, reconfirms that idea of being blameless. No accusation can stick. Why? Well, because he's a manager of the church. He says it's a stewardship that's given, and so he's accountable. And Paul continues here and gives a list of five other character qualities that fit under what I'm calling this uh, category of external character. He mentions someone who's not self-willed. So first, as someone who's not a stubborn person. Not that it's not okay to have your own opinion or to try to express your own opinion or your way of doing things, but this is a person who refuses to work with other people. They're unreasonable. They're hard to work with because they're stubborn. He says they're not to be quick-tempered. This is someone who responds in explosive anger. They don't blow up in front of people. I, I've heard of pastors who have done that, who've blown up on a church member in their office. Not appropriate. Paul mentions that they should not be, um, did I miss one? Oh, here we go. Not be quick-tempered. Maybe I did miss one. Quick-tempered, someone who, uh, who, is, who responds, yeah, I think I messed these up. Sorry, let me read from my notes. Not quick-tempered, someone who responds to explosive anger. Not addicted to wine. Let's go back here. There we go. Not addicted to much wine. Someone who, uh, who is controlled by something other than the Holy Spirit. I mentioned this before. Sorry, Gene, but I, I think this applies to other substances as well, like coffee or energy drink. Gene and I talk about how much we love, we love coffee. Uh, but not addicted to wine. You're not controlled by other things. You know, you drink that five-hour energy drink, and, you know, after you've had a couple of them, you're like, you know, you can't even function right I think that falls under this category by way of application. We're not controlled by other things. Not a bully. Someone who doesn't use the role and position to throw their weight around. Too many pastors, particularly in the IFB circles, independent fundamental, fundamental Baptist churches, uh, too many pastors like to throw their weight around. Well, I'm the pastor and touch not the Lord's anointed. Well... You might need to reevaluate that verse if that's what you're using, but uh, you're not a bully. You're not pushing people around. 
And finally, not fond of dishonest gain. You're an honest person. You don't do tax evasion. You don't siphon funds. You don't steal from the offering. I don't even have access to the safe here. Oh, and our, our uh, head usher is the one who takes care of the funds, and he puts it in the safe. I don't even know the combination, and I don't need to. Why? Because pastors are to not be fond of dishonest gain. I don't go to the casino. Not that that's wrong in every, in every occasion, but I'm not trying to dishonestly or defraud people to win money. All these are what's required of a man in ministry. And sad to say, we know of too many men who are far from this. We know of men who are bullies. We know of men who mishandled money. We know of men who blow up and explode at church members in anger. These things should not be. There's a higher way of doing things, a higher standard for men in ministry. Why? Why such a high standard? Well, because leadership influences membership. So churches need to choose the right leaders. Come back to our text, and we need to finish here. Find our fourth area in which leadership affects membership, and that's in their spiritual devotion. In areas of spiritual devotion, pastors are to set an example on moral commitment in family leadership, in external character, and in spiritual devotions. Or spiritual devotion. Boys and girls, you can draw someone with devotion. The boys helped me with this this morning. They kind of told me things to add. But someone reading the Bible there. Spiritual devotion. This, this makes sense, right? I mean, we would almost say, well, Paul, you didn't even need to put that in there. <laughs> this makes sense. Church uh, is a spiritual family, and we, we express our spiritual devotion together when we come together on Sundays. And pastors are to equip the members of the church to devote themselves spiritually to God. That's Ephesians 4, verse 12. It says that pastors are given for the equipping of the saints, the work of the ministry, the building up of the body of Christ. And if pastors are to exceed at their job, makes sense, they need to learn to do it themselves. And so look at how Paul expresses this in the text. He says, being hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, devout, self-controlled, holding fast to the faithful word according to teaching in order that they are able to exhort and sound teaching and expose those who contradict. Paul gives a few specifics here. Let's briefly talk about those. He mentions hospitable. This idea of hospitality, literally being a friend to a stranger. God expects that pastors are the kind of people who can help a stranger out who can help somebody out who might not be in a, in a position that they can return the favor. They can minister to anyone, whether an old friend or the first time they've met. Paul says pastors are to love what is good. This is a godly person who loves Jesus. Pastors need to be able to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Paul mentions being sensible. This is a self-controlled or discreet person, someone who has the ability to keep their wits about them, not losing their mind amidst the stress and worry and burdens of ministry, while at the same time they're able to express sound judgment under pressure. He mentions righteous. This is pretty self-explanatory here. We're familiar with that word, someone who's marked by upright character. He mentions devout. This is a moral person who lives their life devoted to following God. Self-controlled, someone who is cool under pressure. Also the ability to control their desires. And finally, holding fast to the faithful word. This fits with the qualification in 1 Timothy, where it says pastors are to have the ability to teach. And notice the reasoning here in the end of our text. Paul says, in order that they are able to exhort in sound teaching and expose those who contradict. That's one of the responsibilities of a pastor, to exhort in sound teaching and to expose those who contradict. Pastors are to contend for the truth and guard sound teaching. Well, this is what's required of pastoral ministry. And God holds pastors to a high high standard. There's a high bar set here. Why? Why such a high bar for men in ministry? Well, because leadership influences membership. So God cares about leaders in the church. Well, we saw very clearly how this works for pastors. 
What, what's some practical application for us? What are some next steps? How does this look like for us? I mentioned this last week. Some of you here have never been pastors, and maybe you never will. So is this pastor ir- a passage irrelevant for you? I don't think so. Let me give you a few next steps here this morning. Just have two, and then we'll be done. First of all, expect what God expects of pastors and hold them to a high standard. Don't hold pastors to your own expectations. Hold them to God's expectations. Don't force them to fit your mold, but expect them to fit God's mold. Pray for them, follow them, support them, so you can help them be what God wants them to be. And know what to look for in a pastor. I mentioned this last week. Some people get all afraid when they hear pastors say things like that, like this. I won't be your pastor forever. You know that, right? I won't be your pastor forever. Even if I retire from this pulpit when I'm, when I'm 80 and I can't climb these steps anymore, which is highly unlikely. But uh, for the sake of scenario, even if I retire from this pulpit when I'm 80, one day this church is going to have to find another pastor. What do you look for? It's right here in the text. Look for what God wants. Expect what God expects, whether it be me, whether it be a future man in ministry. And then finally, hold yourself to the same standard you expect your leadership. Don't think that I'm not a pastor, I'll never be a pastor, I don't need to have such a high standard. Don't think that. Not so. What Paul is saying here really is not that all too profound. In fact, there's not one criteria that Paul gives for pastors that can't apply to every believer today. God wants us all to have moral commitment God wants moms and dads, especially dads, to be leaders in their home, to to lead their family well. God wants us all to have the right external character, and God wants us all to be people marked by spiritual devotion. There isn't one category that I mentioned this morning that, that can't apply in some way to all of us. So rather than think, well, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I don't know if I'd be a pastor. Don't have to have such a high bar. We need to think of these as things that can apply to us as well. I need to strive for some of these things. Do you? Do you measure up? Do you strive to live by these standards? Would you make the mark or would you come up short? Let's live a life that follows these standards. Let's not make excuses and say, well, I'm not a pastor, so I don't need to have such a high bar. Let's live the lives God wants us to live. Let's remember leadership influences membership, and we need the right leaders, but also as lay leaders in the church, we need to be the right people. Let's do that this week. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father God, thanks for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for truth. Kind of an interesting passage to preach because most of what I'm I'm saying, I'm preaching to me as a pastor and what I need to be, and I ask that you would help me. That I would be the man that you need me to be in our church. Ask that our people would be the people that you need all of us to be so that we can live the lives of spiritual devotion that you want us to be. And you want us to live. Help us to have the qualities that are mentioned here in this text so that we can take your message and, and show it to others. And we can say, here's the change God did in us. Here's how I'm not living like those in the world. So we can be the people God wants us to be. Help us as a church to have right right expectations, that we would know what your word says and what your word expects of pastors, and that we would hold pastors to that, but not add things to that. Help us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.